You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production in association with City News. When humans think of rapidly advancing artificial intelligence, their minds don't often go anywhere nice. And that's fair enough. We have been primed with decades of science fiction to fear a robot uprising and takeover. And of course, to do that, the machines would have to become sentient, have to be capable of human things like learning, adapting, human speech and language, and even art. Maybe this is why what's known as creative artificial intelligence is currently dominating coverage of the AI community. It makes sense, really, because one of the things that we like to think makes us most human is our capacity to create art that can stir powerful emotions. Wonder, fear, shock, disgust, inspiration, love, all of these things. And to see AI programs like one called Dolly that is now open to the public create those kind of works is to wonder at the power of new technology and also to maybe feel a shiver creep up your spine. But is this new technology creating art or is it still primarily created by the humans who are putting in prompts and selecting responses? Is that art? And if it is, do human artists then have a case considering that it's their work being used to train these machines? Or is this just the future? Messy, a little bit weird, a little bit wonderful, and with bigger questions looming every day. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Stephen Marsh is a writer and a cultural critic. He is the author of a book called The Next Civil War, and he has been covering creative AI for The New Yorker and The Atlantic. Hello, Stephen. Hey, Jordan. How are you? I'm doing well. Why don't you start, uh, for the purposes of this conversation, just by defining creative artificial intelligence. I would say that it's sort of a branch of computational art. So like there are algorithmic stories and there are there are stories derived from word clouds and so on, things like this. But I would say that the new brand of cultural uh, of cultural artificial intelligence is transformer based text generation art primarily. And so that is uh, both literary, like I've written some stories that are and one of them is completely generated by um, text prediction software. Um, but more importantly, I think, is the uh, text to image generators like DALI 2 and Stable Diffusion and Mid Journey, where you're basically able to conjure images by means of prompts. And this is provoking a sort of entirely new form of creative practice, really, um, that is derived from these these generative these generative uh, applications. Can you just give us a few examples of things people might use these programs to create just messing around with them casually? Well, I mean, the the, the sort of text generation stuff, if you go to Pseudowrite or something like that, you can take any text that you want. Um, like I did for the New Yorker, I took a poem from Coleridge, the unfinished poem Kubla Khan, and asked it to finish it, and it finished it in a way that was completely consistent with Coleridge. And if I told you it was Coleridge, you would absolutely believe. The text-to-image stuff, I mean, if you go in and put, you know, cityscape January 6th, Washington, D.C., it will give you a completely generated picture that looks exactly like the January 6th riots on, in Washington. Or if you go in and say something incredibly abstract, like sometimes people are coming out with prompts that are 50, 100 words long, and it will generate like really quite abstract forms. So, you know, I think one of the things to remember about this stuff is that it's just like Stable Diffusion has been around for a month. Dally 2 was like literally open to the public yesterday. So we don't really know what it's going to become, but it, it can generate images from text. And the consequences of that, I think, are going to be pretty amazing. How good are the images that it generates or, to your point, the poems that it finishes? I realize art, if this is art, is subjective, but what's the general consensus? Oh, I don't, there is no general consensus because, like, you're, you're, talking, about, you're talking about very um, elite usages here. Like, you know, Stable Diffusion has been used by a million people in a month. Now, that's incredible. But it's still only a million people. Um, I would say that the images are startlingly accurate. Like that would be eerily accurate, right? Like if you say, 
I would like a tree that grows in Alberta out, coming out of a out of crack of pavement. It will look exactly like you took a photograph of that. Right. And if you when you ask it to continue, you know, poems and stuff like that, like sometimes it produces nonsense, but often it produces things that are completely fit and completely work and are completely meaningful and eerie. And I would say that as I've sort of interviewed engineers who've been working on this stuff, like including the people who invented Transformer, they're quite often shocked with how eerie this tech is. You know, it, also, you have to remember the tech is getting much, much better basically every six months. So it will it will continue to get a, a very, very much better. So let's talk about how it gets better then. How quickly, I know you mentioned every six months there is a new iteration of it, but how quickly does a program itself improve and how do they do that? Essentially take this program invented by Canadians called the Transformer, which is a way of processing huge amounts of data, and then they scale it into basically all of the text that they can find. So in, in the case of GPT-3, which is probably the most famous text prediction software and is the one that's, you know, that's accessible because it's with OpenAI, you know, they used this massive billion-dollar supercomputer that Microsoft lent them, basically, to create um, this incredible 175 billion parameters program. That's GPT-3. 175 billion parameters is a lot, but like Google's Palm which can do truly crazy things like chain of command reasoning in which you can, you know, basically teach it how to think rather than compute. You know, that has 540 billion parameters. And then, you know, and then, of course, like God only knows what actually Google has and what Facebook have. Like they like this is this is not open to the public. The like Google's Palm is I've only seen it because the engineers took me on a tour of it. Um, no one, no, no other researchers outside of Google have access to it. So, you know, tr transformational things are happening behind closed doors. We've been talking about artificial intelligence and what it would mean um, maybe since the beginning of science fiction. I don't know, but it's we've been working on this stuff for quite some time. You mentioned the creation of Transformer. Was there a tipping point? Why is it different now? Why has this ramped up so quickly? Well, I would say that the Transformer paper, which is called Attention is the Only Thing You Need, which was created by um, Toronto and Montreal researchers at Google DeepMind, that to me is like pre and post. Like there's a there's before and after that. It, Transformer is the T in GPT three. Um, it's the key behind uh, OpenAI. Like it, OpenAI is transformer based technology, and it, it it is it is very very different than other forms of machine learning, and certainly very very different from symbolic machine learning. Can you explain how it's different without um, going like six feet over my head? You know, it's honestly about twelve feet over okay. my head. Um, like I've talked to the guys who invented it and had them explain it to me. I don't, I mean, I can sort of explain it to you, but I mean, if you take it with a massive grain of salt and understand that like I'm dealing with things, I've had the people who invent this talk me through it and I don't consider myself an idiot, but it's extremely, I, I would, I would be remiss if I said that I understood it. Right. Like, I, I mean, essentially what it does is it scours language and, creates and finds in it patterns. Um, I mean, that would be, a, I mean, that in itself is a gross oversimplification, but then it inputs these patterns into ways that make things make sense. And all it does, you have to remember, all of this is only derived from text prediction. Like all it is about is, is creating the next word in a way that makes sense. But that, that, feature, that, that capacity, the capacity to make the next word make sense leads to all of this crazy stuff, including, you know, figuring out how proteins work on a level that we could never imagine. And, and all the text to image generation stuff is also the same thing. It's just that tied to, you know, words tied to images. And then you, and then you create images based on the words that you've tied to text. So it actually reveals something very profound in the nature of language, but it, to, too grossly oversimplify in a way that's basically unacceptable, um, but is the limit of maybe what we could talk about conceivably. This machine takes vast quantities of language, uh, like scouring everything in the internet, and it breaks it into tokens, which are not words, they're actually just bundles of letters. And then it finds the patterns between these tokens which are the parameters. And then the more and more parameters you have, the more sensible things become when you ask them to predict to the point where you can get it to create like, you know, 
meaningful paragraphs and meaningful stories that are just derived strictly from prompt. Is that helpful? Yeah, no, that is very helpful. Um, and I think I have a grasp on how it's working. Okay. I mean, really, honestly, like, honestly, that's what I, that's how close as I've been able to get. That's fine. And, you know, the technical details are not necessarily something that we need to obsess over right now, because what you're writing about is, yeah, the implications of this technology and the stuff that it produces, which I want to ask you, is this stuff art? And how do you even answer that question? Of course it's art. Why, of course? We're we're in the 20, we're in the 21st century now. Like over a hundred years ago, Duchamp signed a urinal and put it in a museum and said it was art. I mean, Barnett Newman painted like a strip of black, a strip of red and another strip of black. And, they, uh, you know, and it's the voice of fire. It's an incredibly powerful painting. I mean, we are not... We, we have art left behind handicraft a long time ago. And I mean, to me, the best model is the camera here where, you know, a camera is just a machine and all you do is push a button on the machine. But the difference between me pushing a button on a camera and Andy Leibovitz pushing a button on a camera is vast, right? Like, it, like, it, like it's, it's, it's absolutely enormous. Right. And the the idea that the machines are something there's always been this fear that the machines are going to replace creativity and technology. And they never, ever do. They, in fact, just lead to more explosive forms of creativity. What about the actual human artists here who have in the past or maybe even now are currently producing the works of art that these programs need in order to learn and get better and get closer to uh, replicating what human creativity can do. You know, presumably... I, I just don't understand their... I, I just don't understand their argument. Like, if you if you are a student of... Like, I have read every book by Charles Dickens. I did a PhD in Shakespeare. Do I... Am I, like, am I then ripping off these people right. this is the creative process the creative process is taking what you you know as you know um Saul Bellow said like a, a writer is a reader uh struck to emulation right like who wants to emulate readers who wants to emulate what he what he or she reads right and that like mm -hmm. this is so obvious to me like we exist in traditions we exist in archives this is just another way of processing the archive in a very um, discreet way. I mean, do you think a person who, who makes a building like hasn't taken from every other building that's been built before? Like, like, I mean, or that somebody who paints or takes a photograph isn't, right. pro isn't, you know, taking from what everyone, everyone who's ever taken a paragraph before. I mean, the better you are as an artist, the more references you have. Right. So the idea that that's a, like, this is the creative process. This is the, this is the, the idea that it is the essence of creativity, that we're living in archives of references and making things out of it. I mean, I just, the idea that it's some kind of ripoff to me is just ludicrous. So who's the artist then? The computer program or the person that puts in the text prompt? The person who manages to conjure something out of the machines that's meaningful to people. Just the same way with a photograph. Like, is any, like, it, it's, it's very, you know, People ask these questions when they haven't used it, but when you use it, it's just so obviously a tool, right? Like it's not going to replace anyone, Interesting. right? Like it's going to change the way th certain things are done, but it like, it's not going to, it, it's yeah. not going to, um, like you're, you're not going to, only an idiot is going to say, you know what? Um, I'm going to, I'm just going to go to stability of fusion and wh whip up an ad campaign. I don't need a designer. The, I mean, what they're going to say is we need a, a designer who knows how to use stable diffusion. Right. And like, you know, the, the mastery of the technique will, will of course be, a, you know, a skill like, and the mastery of these, I mean, already you can buy and sell prompts on prompt exchanges um, for Dali two and other things. So uh, like, it, it's just a new form of creativity. Does the person who puts in the prompt own what's being uh created from it well yeah like if you get if you put in something in stability diffusion and it comes up you just have it yeah so if i do that with uh dally 2 which as you mentioned uh just open to the public if you if you were using a uh a, a uh, uh like a photography uh, uh, what's it, like an editing software for photographs and you change a photograph using the tech and change the tone yeah. you own that photograph 
right? Like the way you've changed it. It's the same thing with this. Like right. if you use this stuff and change it, you own it, right? Like it's, it's just a new tech to make it. Now, I think there are like uh, open AI because it was, I think at first they had some kind of uh, restriction on, uh, like they owned it part of it too. But I think that's gone actually. I'm not, I, I would have to check on that. I'm not sure. So one thing that really sticks out to me, and I have uh, played with this stuff just a little bit, obviously not in as much depth uh, as you have, is the difference between a traditional prompt that, you know, like to your point, you say you want, I want a tree growing out of a crack in the pavement and it will give you something that looks extremely realistic to when you put in something that manages to return an image that can like surprise or delight or shock and terrify you, which to me is like the essence of a piece of art, right? Like an, an unrestrained human emotion. So I want you to tell me about how that works. And maybe you want to tell me about Loab because this is a crazy story. Yeah, well, Loab is this Swedish artist named Super Composite who was fooling around with negative weight prompts. So, you know, this is the kind of thing, like when people worked on cameras, they're like, oh, well, you just put the light there and take a picture. But like actually manipulating this text is quite something, right? Like it is not, it is not nothing. So she put in a negative weight prompt, which was uh, Brando negative one, right? So it gave the opposite of Marlon Brando. And this was actually a terrifying, like woman straight out of a horror movie, right? And then whenever she put that in, in various other scenarios, this terrifying woman would kind of come to these scenes to the point where she stopped doing it because it would, it, it created horrible snuff images and things that were really unacceptable. And, um, and so this is like a monster that's lurking in the archives of all these images. Right. And, you know, so that's a, that's a sort of a different thing than, than anything we've ever seen before. It's a new figure out of this tech, a monster of the data set, if you will. And so that's a, that's something new. That's a new form of creativity. And I, I think that the kinds of creativity that are going to emerge from this are going to be quite like this. Like, what is that? I don't know what that is. Um, you know, is, the, is this something the person created or is it something they discovered? It's kind of neither here nor there. What do we call this kind of art as a medium? You mentioned earlier um, when you were talking about word clouds that it's computational art. You know, I can describe like that's an oil on canvas or this is a musical composition for the piano or even just like this is a, a finger on iPad drawing. Uh, what medium is this? Well, this is creative AI, right? I mean, that's what it is. Um, I mean, I think in the case of text to image generation, like you're like the, each form of this, like Dali 2 and Stable Diffusion and Mid Journey, they're all quite different. Like they all have quite different aesthetics. And I think you'll like eventually what will happen is people will build their own data sets and and use AI out of them. But the data is the art form, if you see what I mean. Right. Like that is the like the manipulation of the data is kind of almost lesser than the data that you're manipulating. So, uh, like, I, I mean, I would just call it creative AI. I mean, I don't, that's what everyone's calling it. I don't really think there's a better definition. I mean, you could call it algorithmic art, but I think algorithmic art is actually something quite different because that's not necessarily self-generating, right? It's not necessarily, it's not necessarily as autom as um, intellectually automated where you're you're having something here that is not consciously, you're not in control of it, right? Which is the, you know, the, what's really fascinating here is that you're essentially creating art that you're not in control of. Do you think, and I realize this may come off as a kind of a stupid question, but that we will ever have creative AI artists who become mainstream, have galleries and shows? Like, would you go to a creative AI? They already have galleries. They already do. Oh yeah. There's one, like there's one in the National Faroe Island Museum. Somebody sent me a link on, like it's coming very quickly. I, I do not, I do not have any doubt that there will be prominent AI artists. I mean, there are already artists who are working in this space who are prominent in themselves. Like they, I don't think anyone's ever broke has broken through yet, but you know, it's tough to break through. I'm not sure there are a lot of painters who have broken through. So the last thing I want to ask then is so far we've kept this discussion to art and that's because that's what these programs are made for. Well, they're not made for that. They're actually made for a huge number of other functions. Art is like 
the 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 afterthought of the afterthought. Why are we paying so much attention to it then? Well, because it is totally fascinating and is like and it, and in in sort of interferes in something that we think should be specifically human, i.e., creativity, right? Right. But like this is absolutely coming for weaponry. It is coming for you know every form of human conversation. Like it is it, it is like art is the echo of a change that's already happened, which people kind of don't talk about because um, they're not exposed to it or they don't like unlike search and unlike social media where everyone had an opinion because everyone used this stuff, like almost nobody has used this. And when they do, it's in a very specific way. So it's not, it's not as, you know, as integral to life as these other technological changes, though I, I think it'll be every bit as as urgent. Well, that's why that's why I was asking that question to get at exactly that, which is, you know, this technology has profound implications way beyond art, but as you as you look around and as you look at sort of uh I guess the more prominent press coverage the technology gets and and you're part of that obviously in a m- massive monthly magazine, is the art stuff kind of the like PR face of a really profound technological change that's going on way underneath that, that nobody's really examining. Well, I think art is one thing that's very profoundly human. And in fact, is a way that we connect with our humanity on a basic level, right? I think that's one of its functions, maybe its most important function to me. And so when you, when you see that you, what you're actually talking about is like, like when you call up Canadian Tire and you complain about your tires five years from now and you have a lovely conversation with a woman on the phone and you hang up and then you realize like, you know, that it's a robot or you don't realize it's a robot until much later. Like that's a very profound change in the nature of humanity and our relationship to language. And that's coming, right? Like that's coming on a, like a, a bunch of levels. It, it might already have happened to you, right? And so like that you know, what we're talking about art is it's really a synecdoche for humanity. And so I think that's a perfectly natural way to talk about it. Although, you know, I actually don't think it's talked about anywhere near enough, right? Like I, like I, like I think, I think it's, you know, when you write something about Facebook, you can be assured of many millions of readers. I, when AI, I've, you know, has a much smaller audience interested in this stuff, for sure. I mean, I find it, I'm totally obsessed with it, but it's, it does not have anywhere near the kind of public attention that it deserves. I mean, there's a lot going on, right? Like the threat of nuclear war in Ukraine and like, you know, the collapse of the American political system and so on. But like, I mean, it is really a, a profound change into our, you know, foundational concepts of how language works. I mean, we're about to enter a world where just because something talks in a meaningful way doesn't mean it's a human being. Maybe this thing can save us from those other problems you discussed. We're not having any we're not having any luck solving these things. So technology isn't gonna solve any of our problems. Our problems are ours, you know. Stephen, thank you for this. It's really fascinating. And uh, I would urge anyone listening, if they haven't tried it out, to go and play around with Dali or one of these other ones because uh, you will surprise yourself. Yeah, no problem. That was really fun. Stephen Marsh writes about all sorts of things, but recently about creative AI in The New Yorker and The Atlantic. If you haven't read his book, The Next Civil War, it is somewhat prescient given current events in America. That was The Big Story. If you want more Big Stories, including previous interviews with Stephen, you can head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. You can talk to us on Twitter at thebigstoryfpn. You can email us anytime, hello at thebigstorypodcast.ca. And you can call us. We won't pick up the phone, but you can leave a voicemail, 416-935-5935. The Big Story is available in your favorite podcast app or on the web or via smart speaker. Just ask it to play the Big Story podcast. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow.